Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Saturdays are for the Byzantines podcast. My name is Professor Ren. As always, I am your host. Uh, disclaimer, not actually a professor, don't actually have a PhD, don't actually work for a university. So it's not, that is out of the way. If you found this video, make sure to uh, leave us a like uh, on, the, on the video. Leave a comment as well if you have questions or something you'd like to bring up or you just want to say, hey, nice video or whatever. You know, leave that in the comment section. That definitely helps. Uh, boost us uh, uh, with the algorithms, the, the fabled YouTube algorithms. Um, and then subscribe to the channel and also hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. Uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcast or Google Play, please give us a follow there as well. And then especially if you're listening on Apple Podcast, please leave a five-star review. It really helps. You can follow us on Instagram uh, at academics underscore nine five. That's A C A D E M I X underscore nine five. And we are working on a Facebook page. If you search Professor Ren on Facebook, it might it should come up. There's a little there's a little work I got to do to set this up. A little figuring out to do, but we should we should get there at some point. Um, anyway, today I wanted to quickly get on here and talk about it's one of our midweek videos. So uh, during the week, I try to. Uh, I'm working on releasing, you know, one to, between one and three uh, shorter, you know, 10 to 15 minute videos uh, uh, to break up the longer, you know, 45 to 60 minute lectures that come out on the weekends. And so today I want to talk about the Eastern Roman economy and society uh, in the 500s, because as we're going to see here, right, so very soon we're going to have the fall of the Western Roman Empire. We're going to kind of leave the West behind, although obviously it's still very interesting uh, topic to cover certainly maybe have a future podcast series on on the the, the fall of the Western Empire and the uh, immediate aftermath of the fall of the West. But this is the Byzantines, so we're gonna we're gonna now turn our attention back more towards the Orient. And and what was the economy like in the 500s in the Eastern Roman Empire? And this is going to be important because uh, the Eastern Romans are actually going to see a very good uh, time economically speaking, uh, between, the fall of the, between the fall of the Western Empire and the time Justinian comes into power, which is going to allow Justinian to fund his uh, reconquest of the West, his building of the Hagia Sophia, and his various other projects, which obviously all cost money. And, and the economy that builds in the years leading up to Justinian is going to help uh, tremendously with, with that, because otherwise, you know, you can't pay the soldiers, you can't pay the building cost of the Hagia Sophia the ver and, and various other things. Uh, so as, as uh, I mentioned, life in the Eastern Roman Empire basically goes on after the fall of the West. You know, uh, the, the things kind of go on business as usual. I mean, maybe trade gets dinged a bit because you're not no longer trading with uh, a lot of the places in the West. But the thing is that you're going to have kingdoms that are going to pop up in their, in their stead uh, you're going to have an Ostrogothic kingdom in Italy. You're going to have the Vandalic kingdom in North Africa, although the Eastern Romans are not necessarily friendly with those guys, but you can start trading with, with those people. And the other thing is that the, the same Roman merchants that you were trading with, like in Italy, for example, um, are still going to be there. Uh, they're just, they just have a new ruler. So, so you know, uh, are things not quite as good as they had been? No, because the, the Romans provided, a, it, it was just this giant free trade zone in the Mediterranean and that gets, that gets broken apart. Um, although it's not, I mean, the Romans still control the other, at least half of the Mediterranean. Uh, good economic times you see, especially in Egypt and in Palestine, obviously Egypt's always gonna uh, have decent economy going simply because it's incredibly fertile. It's, it's the easily, easily the wealthiest province in the Roman empire. Uh, but less so in Syria, although Syria is still uh, kind of a trade hub. Antioch is still uh, a trade hub. It's obviously an important city, port city. Uh, the houses of Patriarchal Sea, uh, the four Eastern Patriarchal Seas are in Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Constantinople. And then the most important sea is obviously the, Pont the Roman Pontifical Sea, which is now lost to the Roman Empire, but still the Pope still resides in Rome, and he is still uh, the big man on campus in terms uh, in terms of the Christian world at this point in time. I mean, really, still is still is today. But uh, now, now obviously, there's there's you know, the church has has splintered as has been the case since uh, 1054. But we're not quite there yet. 
uh, in coastal life, you know, obviously port cities are important uh, uh, in Anatolia. Uh, coastal cities are, are big trade hubs like Ephesus, for example, you're going to have a big uh, trade center there. Uh, and then as you go more inland, you're going to have more uh, uh, mining. There's a good deal of minerals in uh, Anatolia, like lead, iron, etc. Um, and then you're also going to have uh, pastoral agriculture. So that's livestock, livestock herding, uh, sheep, goats, cows. Uh, although with the rocky terrain and, and uh, that area, uh, you, you probably see more sheep and goats than you do cows. It's just the, the rugged terrain, uh, sheep and goats do better in, in, a, rugged, in a rugged terrain. As, as we've uh, talked about, we talked about that a bit in our uh, barbarian invasion precursor, which you go back and watch, which is good. We talk about the uh, Central Asia, uh, but the, Hun the Huns have the same deal. Uh, uh, nomadic tribes from Central Asia tend to have more sheep and goats than, than cows. Uh, but all the hubs remain in cities and towns. Uh, Which, which is, you know, it, to be expected. The rural areas are not often going to be the center of, of trade or commerce or uh, uh, culture, really. I, obviously, they're agricultural hubs, and there's still, you know, there's still a lot of people who live out in the country. Uh, and it's interesting, you also see in this time period is that you're going to have uh, farmers who actually are living in cities. Um, so the farmers will live in the city and then commute out to the field every day to, to work on their farms, which is kind of interesting. The, the, I, my guess is this, it has to do with the protection of the city, right? So in the city, there, you know, there's walls and there's guards and there's other people around. But if you're out in the countryside, you know, and someone shows up at your farm at two in the morning, it's probably just you and your family, right? So you want to at least be able to keep your family safe within the walls of the city and then you can go out and work in the fields during the day and then at nighttime when when bad things tend to happen uh, uh, you're protected in the walls of the city uh, christianity is also going to change the roman forum interestingly uh, previously the the roman forum was the place where you went to to do business deals uh, i remember I had a Latin professor in college who basically described it as, uh, you know, you would have a, a wealthy Roman patrician or senator uh, and his uh, posse would come to his house in the morning. Like the guy would basically get out of bed, come downstairs, his posse would be waiting for him uh, in his atrium. And then they would all go to the forum and they would have like a posse off and see like which, which senator, or which patrician or which a uh, fat cat or whatever, uh, like had the biggest posse and, and based on that, like business deals got done and uh, the people, people are networking today. We would call them networking. Right. Um, but, uh, when Christianity comes around, you actually get the, in the atrium of a basilica now becomes like a little forum. So instead of going to the main forum in the market, like in town, uh, you see people starting to have these business, meetings, dealings, conversations in the atrium of a basilica. Today, we would call this uh, the vestibule of church. Uh, it's the little area when you, when you walk into, uh, especially true in Catholic church, I'm not sure about Protestant churches, I haven't been in a lot of Protestant churches, but when you walk into a Catholic church, there's like a little hallway almost before you go in uh, to the main part where, where there's the pews. Um, that's the vestibule. And, and so back then, referred more to as an atrium, but in a basilica, you do see uh, forum activities going on there. And, the, and it's also because when uh, the Romans used basilicas as uh, uh, governmental buildings, because before basilicas were churches, they were used by the Roman, uh, the Roman government. They're oftentimes uh, like ju judicial courthouse type, type buildings. Uh, people would still do this in, in uh, the atrium of the basilica. Uh, it's just now that uh, with the advent of Christianity, they are doing this not because uh, they're they're um, meeting more so in the church because uh, you know uh, Rome's a Christian nation and and so it's it's just a more important cultural totem. Uh, you also start seeing uh, churches and basilicas building uh, baptistries, and that's basically like a little attachment onto the church, or sometimes it might be. Uh, a little building separate from the church, but it's a place where you uh, 
self-explanatory. Baptistry is a place where you have people baptize. Okay, we already talked about that. Uh, also, you start in, uh, in the in the five hundreds in the sixth century. You start uh, the Romans start encountering more uh, and more Arabs. Uh, you see Arabs coming into Roman marketplaces, and they trade uh, their goods like wool, meat, and uh, milk. I believe is what I have written down here. Yeah. Well, uh, milk or other dairy products, and they trade those to the Romans for uh, wheat, olive oil, and wine. And uh, as as you know, if you've studied history, the, uh, the Romans are not going to see any less of uh, the Arabs as time goes on. But initially, uh, the, the relations are not always bad. Uh, in fact, the Romans are going to kind of form friendly relationships with uh, one tribe of Arabs called the, uh, the Gassanids, or the and I know uh, certain people might say, well, that's, yeah, that's not how you pronounce it. That's, that's how I know how to pronounce it. So if you want to give a correct pronunciation in the comments, feel free to do so. I'd love, I'd love to see it. Uh, but so at this, uh, at this point in time, the, you do see the, the Romans are forming relationships with various Arab tribes and doing business with, the, with them as well, as we talked about. Uh, the main crop that's grown in the Roman Empire in terms of farming is going to be wheat. Uh, no surprise there. You need that for you know, obviously make make bread, which is the main staple of basically everybody's diet. Uh, but other common crops you see olives uh, for you know, things like olive oil, grapes obviously for wine, and also figs. Uh, the the ancient world, ancient Mediterranean world, eats a good amount of figs. Uh, I guess if you went to a, a an ancient Roman grocery store, you might see a whole bunch of fig newtons on the shelf. I guess maybe that's like the Roman dessert. Like if your kid uh, uh, does, his, does his homework, you can uh, reward him with some fig newtons. Which doesn't really sound like that nice of a reward. Um, everyone always kind of like, oops. Uh, everybody, <laughs> sorry if you've if you got any funny sounds there. Um, anyway, people, you know, people look back fondly on fig newtons, but they, they I don't think anyone actually really like liked them that much. Uh, and then in terms of industry, you're going to have uh, textiles are going to be a common one. Uh, that's just the process of making fabric. So making, using wool and flax to make uh, cloth used in clothing. Uh, you have places called uh, gynecea, uh, which uh, are so it basically means women's spots, and these are workshops where women go to make to make cloth. Is essentially like I mean, basically a sweatshop. Um, similarly, you know, if you uh, live in the United States, uh, you probably had a great grandmother who worked as a seamstress, you know, worked at a sewing machine in a sweatshop. Uh, I know my my great grandmother. Uh, she were she dropped out of school when she was in like eighth grade to go work in a sweatshop, and you know, working at at the sewing machines. It's it's essentially the same thing, just thousands of years before. Uh, and you can you can know what this what this word means because it has the root like gyna, like a, a woman's uh, reproductive health doctor is is a gynecologist, right? So it's the same it's the same root word. And sil silk will also be imported for a while, although we know as time goes on, this the secret silkworms get get leaked uh, leaked out of China, and and then silk production can spread to various other places in the world. Uh, now, I do want to show you an interesting map here. Uh, and we're really just going to use that one. Uh, so another interesting thing here is uh, the Roman, Roman trade routes. Now, obviously, we talked about how the Mediterranean is a big uh, uh, free trade zone, essentially, uh, especially when the Romans control the whole thing. But even though even now with the fall of the Western empires, we're going to have soon. Uh, the Eastern Mediterranean is still a big free trade zone. Uh, but the Roman, Roman trade routes are not limited to just the Mediterranean. Roman trade is, lar is largely centered in Syria. That's why we said before uh, uh, Antioch is such an important city. You have trade that comes uh, all the way from China. Uh, and I guess you, maybe you could call them early versions of the Silk Road coming by land, but another thing was that the Romans also had trade access to the east, 
like India and then maybe even by extension there, China through the sea, through sea trade. And you say, well, how is that? How does that happen? Uh, the, the, you know, did the Romans like circumnavigate uh, Africa? The answer is no. Uh, what happened was the Romans made, uh, uh, had trade agreements with a group, a group called the Aksumites. They were uh, people who lived in what you would now call Ethiopia. Uh, they were Christians, I believe. Yes, they, they were Christians. Um, and they would trade with the, uh, with the Eastern Roman Empire. Now, but the other thing about the Aksumites is they also, as you can see on the map here with these red uh, dotted lines, also were able to trade with uh, India. They could get to the west coast of India. And basically the way you do this is, you know, uh, as it was taught to me in college, any, any drunk sailor with like a rowboat and a, and a bed sheet strapped to a pole, uh, because the winds are so strong moving uh, west to east over here, uh, basically, any drunk sailor with a, with a bed sheet stapled to a pole uh, can get from Ethiopia here over to to India uh, because of the very very strong winds. Like it, you basically just inevitably get blown over to the Indian coast, and then uh, and that's at certain times of the year. And then at other times of the year, the winds change direction, and so you, you get there. And then when the winds change direction, they come back. So the Romans, through trading with the Axumites also end up having access to uh, trade goods that come from India. Uh, although at the time it would, it would have been called India, but it's you know, the Indian subcontinent, that's what we call it today. And that gives them access you know, to various uh, uh, luxuries, you know, spices or, or common things that come from trade with the East. Although I'm sure, I'm sure there are other things as well. Uh, the Eastern Romans also had trade relationships with a group called the Himyards, which was a predominantly Jewish group in uh, the southern uh, part of the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, one, one would assume that the, the, the Himyards probably had some sort of trade relationship, uh, certainly with the Axumites, but then as well, probably also with, uh, with India. And all of these things, like I say, these are leading up to Justinian's uh, reconquest of the of the West and these economic this good economic time here is important because without without a good strong economy and a lot of money reserved in the bank and we're going to talk more about this as we talk about the next couple of Eastern Roman Empire emperors Leo and Zeno um, those two guys do a good job of building up the Roman economy building up a big cash cow and so then Justinian is going to have kind of uh, financial free reign, essentially, to to go about uh, his various projects. And so this is a little, it's important background information to know. Uh, but if you've made it this far in the video, please make sure to give it a like, uh, subscribe to the channel if you're new, leave a comment if you have any questions, or if you just, if you have anything you want to, you want to add to the video, certainly I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to interact with people in the comment section. Uh, and then hit the notification bell so that you never miss another video. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Google Play, please give us a follow. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please also give a five-star review. We are on Instagram. You can check us out at academics underscore nine five. That's A-C-A-D-A-M-I-X underscore nine five. And you can check us out on Facebook as well. The page isn't fully running yet, but if you look up Professor Ren on Facebook, I'm pretty sure something will come up. So, Thank you all for watching and I'll see y'all next time.